from my sorrow I felt But Jesus came and listened to me And glory to God, He set me free He set me free, He set me free He broke the bonds of prison for me I'm glory bound by Jesus to see For glory to God, He set me free Now I am climbing higher each day Darkness of night has drifted away My feet are planted on higher ground And glory to God, I'm homeward bound He set me free, He set me free He broke the bonds of prison for me I'm glory bound, my Jesus, to see For glory to God, He set me Not of this world shall turn me around Daily I'm working, I'm praying to And glory to God I'm going through He set me free, He set me free He broke the bonds of prison for me I'm glory bound my Jesus to see for glory to God, He set me free. He set me free. He set me free. He broke the bonds of prison for me. I'm glory bound, my Jesus, to see. For glory to God, He set me free. Amen. It's been a good Sunday already. If you weren't here this morning, you missed out. Uh, great message. And, uh, you know, I can't tell you how many times that I've sat down well, in my own life and gone, well, the only thing left we can do is pray. And, you know, you catch yourself going, wait a minute. That's the best thing that you can do. And, uh, and I hope that every one of us is aware. I got a testimony years ago. Me and Brother Hardy were talking about, he was talking about a uh, one time somebody on the road made him irritated and he was wearing his Jesus shirt and he said you know he goes I'm sitting there with a scowl on my face and and um uh you know and I, here I am with with Jesus on my on oh, I'm wearing a Jesus shirt and I, and I, I was thinking about a time years ago me and a, another former member Bob Shuning in our church he was following me our church bus broke down Longview Bible Baptist Church pasted all over the side and we finally get off. It broke down in Vancouver. We drive it up, and I'm getting off the off-ramp here in, in Longview. And, uh, and this homeless guy comes up, and he, um, he, he asks for money. Well, you know, I do what most of us do. I don't make eye contact with him. And um, I'm like, he's got nicer shoes than me. Go get a job. You can, you can say, you know, I can. you want fries with that? And so... I'm sitting there, I don't make contact with him, and, and he, um, he comes up and he puts his middle finger right up against our church van door, you know, just like right up, and I'm just enraged like that. And I roll down the window and I'm yelling at this homeless guy, and meanwhile there's a stack of cars behind me and the, the church van guy's yelling at the homeless guy, you know, go get a job, and you know, and, uh, and, and I'm like ready to get out, and Bob is like, Pastor, no, no. <laughs> and I thought, you know what? There are a lot of things in this life that um, get us riled, get us upset. But we're saved. We're on our way to heaven. And, uh, and, and I wonder if when we think about that, how many times we think about the testimony of Jesus Christ. It was a great message this morning. Brother Hardy, it is our privilege and pleasure to have you here with us. Thank you for coming. Would you come and preach to us, brother? Amen. 
Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Pastor House. Privilege to serve and minister the word to you all this morning. More of you showed up. I like it. We're building. The next show will be even more full. I'm ready to go. Uh, I want to say thank you for a lot of things. Thank you uh, again, Pastor House, for the chance. Thank you for putting us up at a hotel. Thank you, dear church, for uh, hosting us. Maybe you didn't even know it, but you have been. You treated us real nice. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I want to, I want to do a good job uh, for you this morning. Uh, let's see. What do I want to do first? Uh, I was on my way to hell for real. And then Jesus saved me. Amen. He saved me. I didn't do anything. I didn't buy like some fancy escape route. I didn't do a bunch of good works. There were no religious ceremonies that could rescue me. Uh, I had to be saved, and Jesus did it. And I want you to know that just like I was on my way to hell, every single man and woman born into this world is on their way to hell. We're born in sin. And, and then we grow up, and we start doing our own kinds of sin, and we find our favorite sins. And so we're not only born with sin, but then, then it just, it's in our DNA. It comes out. If you don't believe me, I dare you to go work in the toddler room right now. No, no parent ever sat down with their three-year-old and said, Hey, listen, come here. At church this Sunday, if you're in there and that kid's got that toy you want, I want you to walk up first and steal it. Just go and steal it. If they come at you, I'm going to tell you what you can do. Number two, try and murder them with it. And then if you get caught trying to murder them, when the teacher says, Was it you? You just look at them and lie. You might get away with it, kid. No parent has ever done that. That's happening right now in some room in God's house. Attempted murder, stealing, and lying. It's because it's in our blood. We get older, we just hide it better. And if we die in that condition, we go to hell. And Jesus Christ came to save sinners. He was died for, for our sins on the cross. He shed his blood. He was buried. And on the third day, he rose again. He is alive and seated at the right hand of God right now. And today is the day of salvation. If you're here today and you don't know what's going to happen to you when you die, congratulations, you've come to the right place. Because all these people are wonderful and brilliant? No, because they've got this. And many in here know how to use it and show you what God has said about your soul and about his salvation. And so, honestly, if you're here today and you want to know, Ask people around you. They'll direct you to someone or they can help you directly and say, look, this is what God's word says. And you can know today that you and God are square. That when this life is over, you will be with him, that your sins have been forgiven through the blood of Jesus Christ. So today's the day. It's happening all over the world today. Souls are being saved today. Even right now, potentially, there is some soul that's being translated from darkness to light by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I know souls are being saved today because the gospel is being preached today all over the world. And the gospel is God's power into salvation all around the world today. So listen, do not think you're the only one that's got this problem. If you're here today and you need to be saved, today's the day. That's it. You're at the right place. I was a little bit overwhelmed uh, as we sang this morning because I started thinking about my church family down in Salem. And we start service at 11 o'clock, just like we did, right? We start at 11. We sing songs. Just like we sing song, we sang songs together here. We sing the same songs. I can sing all those songs without looking at most of the words. There's one verse I didn't know. I was like, what verse is that? We don't have that verse. I want that verse. And I was like, wait, they're making stuff up up here. But it was doctrinal. I liked it. No. It, it was like the third verse. That's the one we don't sing in churches, right? Somebody's got me. He's like, amen. Yeah, what happened to the third verse? It's just too long, man. But I was a little bit overwhelmed as we sang um, as the deer panted for the water because I thought about my family back in Salem singing at the same time we're singing. And I thought about Jesus up in heaven. And he's like, yep, there's some of my redeemed right there. Look at they're singing for me. And then we go up 90 miles. He's like, yep, there's some of my redeemed singing for me. I believe uh, the Lord Jesus is praised 24 hours a day, seven days a week on planet Earth. I think he does it on purpose. I think that might be one of the reasons that you have a one o'clock service. <laughs> like, I'm serious. I'm serious. One of the angels said, uh, Pacific Standard Time, we need a one o'clock. And God, God's, the Holy Spirit touched Pastor House. He said, one o'clock. He said, all right. 
I, I, think, I think around this globe, Jesus Christ is praised by a local congregation 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And it matters that you sing. It's important. And I just thought, all over the world, like, it's West Coast, so it's our turn, right? The East Coast has been doing it. It started, the sun came up, and good, Bible-believing, gospel-preaching, Jesus-loving churches assembled together, and they gave God praise and glory that He is worthy of, and it moved across the continental United States, and now it's West Coast. It's our turn. we got to sleep in, so we're doing it better than the rest of them. <laughs> right? They're, they're all thinking about evening service already. Like, we're just getting started. Yeah. But it's our turn. And, and up and down the West Coast right now, other born-again believers are giving God praise and glory and preaching His book. Amen. Just remember that when we just... I know how church goes, especially if you've got little ones. You barely got here. Somebody smells a little bit like puke, you know? It's just, I know how it goes. You get the first one ready, strap them in the car, just be like, okay, we'll be back eventually. You get the next one ready, you put them in the car, we'll be back. Maybe... The drive here was interesting. You need to have the altar call before we preach. I don't know. But we get, we get little in our, in our vision sometime, and I'd like you to just, just get big and just remember that there's, um, there's a world full of believers praising God today. And that, that sounds so Joel Osteen. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> it just does, right? It's like, friends. But I was just overwhelmed thinking of, about the assembly of Bethel singing those same hymns that we're singing together here. And it's such a privilege to get to sing those same truths and praises to our God with you, my brothers and sisters. So I'm thankful for it. Uh, you can turn to Mark chapter 4. I was thankful. I think on the screen I saw Gary Matheny, missionary in Romania. Amen. I've been in his church. We, we have been heavily invested in Romania for... Oh, 25 years. One of our very own got saved. And God called him to the mission field. He called him to Romania. He worked alongside Gary Matheny for a while. Uh, I went and visited. Uh, I became the pastor, and the church said, Pastor, you love missionaries. I said, yeah, I do. They said, you should go see one every year. I said, all right, deal. Great. So I went to Romania, visited our own guy first, met Brother Matheny, went to his work. He's doing a great work. They're awesome. Loved it. Uh, next year, I went to Cameroon, Africa uh, for Tom Needham. We support a bunch of people in Cameroon, and that place, the gospel was burning through the jungle. And then they had civil war. And the devil started a different fire. And I'm telling you what, our guys had his airplane shot at. Uh, they had to abandon their compound that they'd been in for 25 years. They live in the city now. They're learning to speak French because it's a completely different language spoken in the city. Uh, but I went there, and we flew in there. And it was, it was uh, an adventure. I like adventure. I like dangerous things. I think it's fun. I know I'm saved. Somebody's got to live by faith. So I bought a motorcycle. You know, why not? Here we go. Right? Either you, eh, never mind. I'm going to justify unwise purchases for the next 20 minutes. Uh, <laughs> so we flew down there. It took forever. It was a blessing. At the end of the story, I came back to the church. I said, hey, this whole going to missionaries every year, it's pretty cool. How about you do it? I'm tired. That was scary. They all laughed. And I'll go back eventually, but it was hard. I'm kind of a homebody. We fly down there. And our missionary hires this guy to come meet us at the luggage thing because the missionary couldn't go into the airport. And this guy that looked like he was a professional bodybuilder shows up. And he's, you know, pasta. And I was like, yes, hi. Are you earnest or graceful or whatever his name was? And he said, yeah. And I said, this is the best thing ever. I'm surrounded by all these people I don't know, speaking a language I do not know, in a place I do not know, out of the country, clear into Africa. I love that this giant human is my friend. <laughs> okay? So he helps us. We get all our bags, and we've got a bunch of them. We're bringing supplies to the missionary. We get out front, and somewhere along the line, the sun went down. I don't know how that happened, but it, the sun went down somewhere. I guess it happens every day. But anyway, we get out, and the missionary has to go get his trooper, his Azuzu trooper, right? So he disappears, and we're standing on the sidewalk, and it's dark out, and all there is is this concrete barricade about 25 feet away from us that separates the parking lot, which is just a dirt field, and then the roadway, and then there's us sitting on the sidewalk, and we're sitting there waiting, and it's dark, and there's one really yellow light across the across the street here. And all I can see is silhouettes of men sitting on this concrete thing. 
and it's just really dark. It's kind of unsettling. We've been traveling for 44 hours at this point, so I'm just not loving life. If you have to shave in an airport, you do, you're doing something wrong. You don't need to keep traveling. But anyway, we're standing there, and all of a sudden, there's this little man, and he is thunking me in the chest. And he says, you're the boss. You're the boss. And then he knew another English word that went with the finger uh, that you got on the church bus. And he's just throwing that at me. And he's like, you're the boss. You're the boss. And he's cussing at me. I have two ladies with me and another man. I look around. Muscle guy is nowhere to be found. <laughs> he is gone. He vanished. He ghosted us in a minute. As a matter of fact, I think it might have been a setup. Anyway, don't tell him that, though. <laughs> If you ever meet him, uh, giant Cameroonian man. Anyway, he is thumping me and he is cussing and more guys are coming around. And so basically I put all my little chickens behind me because I'm the boss, right? And he is thumping me and I'm looking down. And I have no idea what he's saying. And I'm thinking, what am I doing here? For real, what am I doing? I'm not called to Africa. I I'm going to preach to a translator. That's going to be completely, you know, useless. Why am I here? And as things get darker and people start assembling, I'm thinking, there is nothing we can do. You're not going to throw a punch, right? There's 50 people sitting in the darkness just waiting for the white guy to make a move. <laughs> and this white dude is not making a move. I'm sitting there. Finally, the trooper pulls up, the Azuzu trooper. Our missionary jumps out. He's, he listened to him. He said, did they help you with the luggage? I said, no. He says they carried all your bags and they want your money now. I said, well, they didn't. Then I see his face, and it kind of drops. And he says, hurry up. We end up throwing luggage, and guys are just assembling. We end up locking the doors and actually peeling out of this place. And I'm thinking, what am I doing here? We end up getting to their compound. I end up sleeping in an apartment above the hangar. And by apartment, I mean 8 foot by 10 foot room with a foam, 3 inch foam padded mattress on a piece of plywood. And as I go out there, the missionary says, hey, here's the key for the padlock on the door. Lock it after you go in. I said, why? He said, because it's not strange for villagers to come out. And we're in the jungle at this point. We drove six hours into the bush. He says, it's not strange for villagers to come in and take your stuff while you're sleeping and grab one of the new machetes that we got in town yesterday. I'm like, all right. <laughs> so I head out with my little cell phone light through the yard up to the hangar. Unlock it, get in, there's another hasp, put it back on there, lock it. There's bars on this little one foot by one foot window. There's a three inch foam mattress, which works really good for a 250 pound man. That's, that's a blessing. And I'm just thinking, Lord, you got some promises in there. And it says, the angel Lord encampeth round about those that fear him. And I'll tell you this right now, I'm really afraid. <laughs> So I, I knew what to do. I said, i got to read my Bible before I go to bed. And so I, I, I laid down on that, that foam uh, little mattress there, and I grabbed my pillow, and I tucked it under my sternum, and I got out my Bible. And as soon as I did, this giant spider appears from the left side. I'm talking this big around. It's black, and it goes like this. It just runs across the top of my Bible and down the other side. And then I'm thinking, wait, that was my chance to kill it. <laughs> I was paralyzed with fear. Now it's just in here. I'm picking up the foam mattress, the plywood. I got the machete. I'm like, I'm like, what am I doing? I was scared. You would have been too. Somebody's in here, no, I raised tarantulas. Uh, whatever. Fear messes you up. Mark chapter 4. It says in verse 33. Mark chapter 4, verse 33, And with many such parables spake he the word unto them as they were able to hear it, but without a parable spake he not unto them. And when they were alone, he expounded all things to his disciples. And the same day, when the even was come, he saith unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship, and there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him, and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose, and rebuked the wind, and said unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. 
And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, What manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? It's not strange to be scared sometimes. It's natural. It's not strange. Sometimes it's natural. You don't have to drum it up. You don't have to look for it. You don't have to summons it. It just appears. It's just there. You get that feeling in your gut, crawls up the back of your spine, and all of a sudden, flight or fight kicks in. Part of it, God's put it in there to keep us from, I don't know, probably jumping off cliffs or bungee jumping or skydiving or buying motorcycles, but we have overcome that. <laughs> part of it has to do with our uh, physical safety. There's a great deal of it that is just flat out sin. We see a case like that with the disciples here, and it's one you've read a bunch, you know it, and you are thinking to yourself right now, oh, I can preach this sermon, and you can, I promise, but I've got the notes, so I will. <laughs> and I just want us to kind of have a little Bible study here together. I want you to think a little bit. This has been a profitable thing for me to rehearse to myself. Uh, actually, uh, a dear friend of yours, and now, thank the Lord, a dear friend of mine, Pastor House down in Lebanon, Andrew with Liberty Baptist Church. I'm trying to send a bunch of people there. Uh, I got folks that come from Albany, which is between us, that I don't particularly care for, that I'm trying to get to go to. <laughs> get them to Liberty. Um, but we'll see how that goes. Uh, but he, he was kind enough to let me come and open the Word of God for his folks. And this is a message God put on my heart, and he'd been working on it. And I, it's just something that's been a help to folks, and so I hope it'll be a help to you. But uh, we kind of worked through it together a little bit this morning. And uh, question number one, you don't actually have to participate, but I just want you to think about these things. Uh, we see the disciples here. They get in the ship. We know the story. There's a storm. Uh, question one is, were they, were they right to be afraid? And I'd say, yeah. Were they in trouble? <laughs> yes. They were in trouble. There was real danger. There, there, I was afraid there's a guy thumping me on the chest, cussing at me, trying to get something from me, and, and a posse assembling. And I'm in a foreign land. I'm thinking, we are toast. We're toast. This is done. This is going to be my missions trip to Africa. Long plane flight, beat down, hospital stay, maybe, hopefully, plane flight back then. Were they right to be afraid? It says the water was coming in the ship. It says there was a great storm. The, wa the waves beat into the ship, and it says the ship was full of water. Do any of you do boats or ships, a yacht? Excellent. <laughs> Probably bad to have water in the boat. Feel like that would be something that would be bad. I almost drowned in the ocean. I was caught in a riptide, spent 45 minutes out there. Wasn't fun. Don't really like the ocean anymore. And I'm sure there's sharks everywhere now. But... Were they exaggerating the circumstance? Were they making a mountain out of a molehill? We do that sometimes, right? Yeah. Uh, you go to the doctor's appointment, they take, 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 take blood, and then you miss their next call, and it says, listen, we're going to need you to call the office back, and you give yourself cancer immediately. Yeah. And they say, we had a mix-up with your insurance information, and you go, oh, oh wonderful. Charge me a million dollars. I don't even care now. I, I, I gave myself brain cancer, so this is great news. <laughs> You are exaggerating things. Are the disciples exaggerating right now? They're not exaggerating things right now. As a matter of fact, these are the professionals. These are fishermen. You know this. They've spent time on the sea. The professionals are saying, this is scary. It's one thing when the novice gets scared of something. Somebody that doesn't do something very often, or they're new to something, and it scares them. If you're going to discern whether or not you should be afraid, you don't follow them. Our missionary to Africa, Tom Needham, when Ebola was going through Africa... He was back in the stateside. I had him into our church. I said, whoa, Ebola? Everybody's dying? We've been praying for you guys. What are you going to do? We've been watching the news, and, and they're showing us all this stuff. And he goes, oh, well, yeah. I was like, well, yeah, what? Well, I, I mean, it comes through every 10, 12 years, and then it goes away. I'm like, wow. Okay, uh, has anybody called the news and told them that? <laughs> like, I feel like the people at Fox and CNN, we, they'd really benefit by this information. 
And that was the first day that I thought they might not be telling me the truth yeah. on the news. I was like, wait a minute. He's a pro. He lives in Africa. He's been there some, some 30 years. And he says, yeah, it happens. And all of a sudden, my, my fear level, my, my anxiety for my brethren in Africa went down. I was like, oh, okay, the guy lives there. And then he says it's going to be all right. This isn't the case here. These are professional men that have spent time on the sea, and their boat is full of water, and they are afraid. Okay? Which means any novice should be very afraid. Can you imagine Matthew, the tax collector? I did not sign up for this! <laughs> right? You, I mean, you got some office workers that are thinking, what in the world? Where's that patch that makes me stop puking, you know? <laughs> it's like, what is going on? The fact of the matter is there are scary things in this world. There really are. I know you guys have heard of the vid, and I would like to say this. I call COVID the vid, so it's like a superhero drug. I don't know. I want to say thank you for the way you have navigated Pastor House and Dear Longview Bible Baptist Church, the way you've navigated this season that has been scary and strange. You've held the fort. Here you are. Other churches have not done the same, and their doors are closed, and their buildings are for sale. My brother lost his church when COVID hit. The pastor flipped out, went into hiding. The custodial team didn't even know where he was. Their church closed. It's gone. He's going to a Presbyterian church now. I'm like, wait, what? He's like, they're the only people. He lives in California, so. All right. We all know what's going on there. So I'm going to say thanks. Thank you for holding the fort, staying true to Jesus Christ. Uh, we're all learning, right? We're trying to see what we were made of, what COVID was made of, what the world was made of, what the health authority was made of. There's some scary stuff, but you, you did a good job, and, and you're here, and you look strong, and I praise God for that. So amen, and, and bless you. Uh, in the name of Jesus Christ, bless you. Thank you for that. There's scary things in this world, and they're real. You're not exaggerating. Cancer is scary. I, I think I, I, I'm not afraid of dying, but I'd kind of like it to be quick. Right? That's so why I bought a motorcycle, I guess. There we go. The donor bike. I'd kind of like it to be quick. Uh, I'm scared for other people's reactions to me dying. You know, when you're younger and you got grown kids or even younger kids, you worry not so much about yourself, but you worry about your wife and your children. Those things will scare you. What will happen? There are things that are scary in this world. Uh, you are on a fixed income. You finally retired. Congratulations. You worked your whole life. You gave the government a bunch of money while you did it. Now they're finally giving some of it back at a very fixed rate. And that's okay. You managed it. You figured it out. But then all of a sudden, the gas pump price went up. And the rent at your facility went up. And it costs a million dollars. Just go to McDonald's now. And, and so though you had this retirement, you had a plan and a schedule, things are changing. That's scary. What am I going to do? I can't go get a job. There are things in this world that are naturally scary. These disciples were right to be scared, but they were rebuked. They're not exaggerating things. They really are in trouble. They're afraid, and all of us in the room are, are thinking, yeah, you should be. You'd kind of be stupid if you weren't afraid, Right? You'd say, I don't think you're rightly appraising the situation. We're in a boat that's full of water. It's the middle of the night. We're all going to die and drown. And yet they were rebuked. Jesus rebuked them for their fear. Why? Well, he said, our clue is, he says, how is it that you have no faith? Well, all right. What were they supposed to have faith in? What were they supposed to have faith in? Well, you say, well, Jesus was there. Great. He's asleep. You ever felt like Jesus is there, but he just ain't paying attention to you? You know he's present, right? You've done your theology. He is omnipresent. You're like, yep, everywhere, all the time, at once. He sees everything. He, is, he knows everything. You know that. But it's just, it's not your day, right? It's just, he's kind of like, ah, you're on your own on that one, buddy. What are they supposed to have faith in? Well, they're supposed to have faith in the presence of the Lord. Right, he's asleep. Okay, well, you know what? He knows. Jesus knows. Right, he doesn't care. You can go through some hard stuff in your life, and you know your theology. You know your Bible. You know God is present, and you know he knows. 
It is not strange for you to have this whisper, though, that comes up and says, yeah, but he doesn't care. Even as a born-again, Jesus-loving, Bible-reading, church-attending Christian, there is that little shadow that creeps up your spine and says, he doesn't care, though. And the reason we, just, we can justify that because we say, if he cared, he would fill in the blank, right? And so we say, I know, I, I know he's there, I know he knows, but here's the fact of the matter, he doesn't care. You wouldn't say it in church, you might not say it to your spouse, but there's that little place of terror when you're all by yourself and you're putting head to pillow that you're thinking, I don't know if he's willing. You know he's able, but you don't know if he's willing. And you'll say, why? Well, because I haven't been living the way I should. So uh, it would make sense if you let me drown here. And we start getting more afraid, and we start getting more afraid. What were they supposed to have faith in, Jesus? You were there, but you were asleep. I don't know how that looks. Well, I mean, we're just going to be rowing. The waves are smashing, and the boat's filling up, and you're looking back, and he is asleep. And I don't know if a part of his garment has come off the bench that he's laying on and the water, it's in the water, you know. And as the boat rocks, that, that part of his garment just rocks with it. You can see the white in the water in the dark and he's just asleep and the water splashes up and, and, and his legs are, get a little bit wet and his arm is hanging in the water and you're thinking, this can't be real life. We're all going to die here. And then somebody finally says, go wake him up. And then somebody else says, no, you go wake him up. And they come and they say, don't you care that we perish? And, and we've given the disciples a hard time about that. I have. I'm very spiritual. <laughs> I'm very mature. I would have never done that. But they are in trouble. They're not exaggerating. Jesus is asleep. And when he wakes up, he says, you guys are wrong to be afraid. Why don't you have any faith? And I'm going to say, what are they supposed to have faith in? You know what they were supposed to have faith in? It's verse 35. It's the very end. Where it says, let us pass over unto the other side. What were they supposed to have faith in? His word. Amen. Look at this. Thus saith the Lord, let us pass over unto the other side. At some time, in some way, in some place, in the heart of those men, there should have been the faith that grew up and grabbed a hold of the word of God that said, no, he said we're going to the other side. We're all going to die, man. We're all going to die. That's Matthew. He's climbing the mast or something, you know. He's just flipping out. And Peter could go up and grab him and say, no, he said we're making it to the other side. Sit down, Matthew. No, 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 he said we're going to the other side. Right, but the boat's full of water. It doesn't matter. He said we're going to the other side. Do you understand they had the word of God that they were supposed to trust? Do you understand his word was draped over a catalog of miracles up to that point? He had healed the demon-possessed. He had healed the lepers and the blinds and the sick. I said leopards. I meant lepers. <laughs> Thank you for letting that one slide. I couldn't let it slide. He turned those leopards to tigers. He healed lepers and blind men. He healed demon-possessed people. He healed Peter's mother-in-law, who was sick with a fever. In other words, he'd done a lot of mighty things that he said he was going to do. Then he did them. They had witnessed that. And then he said, we're going to the other side. And somebody in the darkness with a wet beard and wet hair and a wet garment could have been just with that little bucket of water going, we're going to the other side. What are you talking about? He said, we're going to the other side. You're soaked, man. Look at Jesus is going to drown if we don't wake him up. They had his word. Dear Christian, you have his word and you also have his miracles. When you were absolutely 100% worthless on your way to hell, there was a moment where you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and he saved your soul forever. He knew right where you were. He saw the guts of you and he said, they believe me. They believe me. They trust me. And my word has declared that whosoever believeth on me will not perish, but have everlasting life. They are mine. They're born again. My spirit's in them. They're my child. An inheritance is for them. A mansion in heaven. It was done. And you might have been in your bedroom six years old with your mom in the backside of Montana. And he said, yeah, I am able. I am willing. You are saved. That was your first miracle. Um, the miracle before that might have been the fact that the gospel got to you. 
He saved your mom, your grandma. There's some generation stopper that believed Christ. You've seen his miracles. Then you've probably seen them since then. You've been supplied. You've been delivered. You've been helped. You've been given wisdom. Your prayers have been answered. So God has given you his word, and you can trust it. Question, what was the best case scenario for this night, for this team of guys? Well, here's the best case scenario. You get on the ship. Jesus says you're going to the other side. The storm comes. The waves are bashing against the boat, and it's filling up the boat. Jesus is asleep, and you've got 12 guys sitting there going, we're good. We're good. It's up to their shins. It's up to their knees. Somebody's getting a little bit antsy. Thomas is going, I don't know, man. I don't see shore. And somebody else goes, no, we're good. It's up to their sternum, right? I mean, we're talking about a boat full of happy idiots right now, right? <laughs> they just saying, you know, if the, the Coast Guard comes by, you, you guys, we're here to help you. Why? We're fine. <laughs> the, the boat's getting lower in the sea. And then you get stuff's floating out, some ropes just off it goes. There goes lunch. And you're like, yeah, no, we're good. We're good. Move along, Coast Guard. Appreciate you. Be that's best case scenario. Best case scenario is the water keeps filling the boat until Jesus sits up and smiles. Like, all right. That's best. And we're all looking at it saying, that's ridiculous, right? But that's the best case scenario where he hears his men whispering, he said, we're going to make it. He said, we're going to the other side. And Jesus sitting up, maybe grinning, saying, good job, men. Then he rebukes the wind, the sea. That's the best case scenario. Did it happen? Didn't happen. Didn't happen. Did Jesus know that it was going to go like this? Yeah, he did. Well, that's kind of cold. <laughs> did he know they were going to fail the test? Yeah. Yeah, he did. And he did it anyway. The Lord Jesus had no expectation that they were going to uh, <laughs> be swimming. And somebody going, I guess we're swimming to the other side. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he said we'd make it. He didn't say how. Jesus knew that they would fail, and yet they were there. They were there on purpose. It, it was a little while ago that I re recognized that everything that God allows into my life is truly allowed by him. So if something really horrible happens tomorrow in my life, my Father in heaven said, yeah, that can, that can go through. He can handle that. Then that's a, that's a, that's a really, it's, it's a hard way to look at life. Yeah. One of our dear missionaries in Peru, Brother McCormick, I don't know if you guys support him, they just lost their little girl. Uh, his wife carried full term. They thought everything was great. Um, her name's Kaylee. She's with Jesus now. Uh, they had no idea that her heart was broken, messed up, and she lived 30 minutes after mom delivered. And they sat there and they mourned and they praised the Lord and then they had to go home to two little boys. And when they came in the door, one of the little boys says, Dad, where's Kaylee? And they got to tell two little boys, the little sisters of Jesus now. That was coming down the pike, and Jesus said, Yeah, they can handle that. That can pass. These disciples were there on purpose. The Lord Jesus said they can handle this. Yeah, but they're not going to do it right. They're, they're going to fail. And the Lord said, yeah, I know. Send them in. Why were they there? Well, we say it was to prove their faith. Yeah, prove their faith to Jesus? He already knew their faith. He knew they were going to blow it. He knew they couldn't handle it. He knew they'd get scared, and they'd wake him up, and they'd ask him the most awful question anybody has ever asked the Lord. You don't, you don't care that we die? I mean, he left his throne in heaven, right? Took on flesh, was born of a virgin. Became the second and last Adam so that we wouldn't die. They say, you don't care that we perish? It's not, it's not an accident they use that word. Jesus knew all that was going to happen, but they were there. Was it to prove their faith? Not to God. It was to prove their faith to them. If they thought they could handle something like that ten minutes ago, now they knew they couldn't. They knew their faith was little when that got done. 
You said, hey, if you go on that ship and it starts filling up with the water and the only thing you got to go on is the word that Jesus said that you will make it to the other side, you think when that thing gets full of the brim, you're going to be all right? Oh, yeah, I'll be fine. I can handle that. Yeah, no problem. Okay, well, now if you thought that, now you know you were wrong. Do you understand that what was going on on this night was much bigger than the moment? That what was happening on this evening was much bigger than what was happening on this evening? A very real day was coming when every single one of those disciples, except for Judas Iscariot, was going to stand before some sort of magistrate and receive the sentence of death. That they were going to stand before the leaders of the Sanhedrin who said, do not preach his name anymore. And dear Peter, look at John and say, hey man, we're going to the other side. We're going to keep on preaching. You want to whip us, you want to beat us, that's fine, but we'll be at church tomorrow. Preach the name of Jesus Christ. That every single one of those disciples would be hanging on a cross or have a sword to their neck. They were being killed one by one and each one of them would go to their death saying, he's alive. He is alive. The, The one you crucified, he's alive. We're going to cut your head off. That's okay. Can I get a nap in first or we're going to go right now? That was Peter. He was just snoozing. He's like, oh, okay. Angel says, get up. You're not dying yet. Every single one of these men would go to their death testifying that Jesus Christ resurrected from the dead. And on this night, they'd learned their faith was little. And God showed them how big he was, and they'd stand at that guillotine and say, we're going to the other side. Let's go. We've seen it through the ages. Men and women of faith have lost their lives, spilled their blood, knowing that they were going to the other side. And all they had was the word of God. And it was enough. Why are they there? You understand God is still proving the faith of his people. Sometimes we've done good and sometimes we've done bad. But he's prepping us all the way. You look at Abraham. When God shows up, he says, hey, follow me. We're going to go on a walk. Abraham says, all right. You know, the end of that walk is, give me your son, your only son, whom thou lovest, and offer him as a burnt offering unto me. That's where the end of the walk was. Jesus said, I'm building you, I'm building you. You're in a boat. It's filling with water. They're going to throw you in a vat of boiling oil someday, John. John went through, and this is tradition, we don't know for sure. But if he did, he went through the uh, vat of burning oil better than he did the Sea of Galilee. You know what I mean? He was like, whoo, toasty. Thank you. I'm going to the other side. Bring it on. God is always prepping his people. There is a bigger day coming, and you might find yourself in a situation that's scary, and you're not exaggerating it. It's a big deal. It could bring trouble in your life. Now, it's not about traveling to the other side, and I I feel like we've all, as churches, kind of learned a lot about the government and COVID and things like that, and we've kind of made our decision by now. Uh, And so a lot of our fear might creep into a relationship that you're scared to forgive or be forgiven. It might be a relationship you're scared to love because you might get betrayed again or forsaken again. It might be a witnessing opportunity that God is hammering you. Like right now, I say witnessing opportunity and their name just popped in your head. And you've been scared to say something because what are they going to think of me? You've been afraid for real. God says, listen, (laughs) this is the gate. This isn't even the big deal. This isn't even the big show. There's something coming someday that you need to believe me more. You need to step up to the plate here, follow through, obey me, and you understand there's a day coming where things are going to be a lot bigger, but you're going to be fine. You're going to stand in front of the giant Goliath and say, hey, yeah, so there was a bear, there was a lion, killed them with these. You'll be just like one of them. God says, listen, I want you to go fight that bear right now, and you are terrified, and there is trouble, and it could hurt, but you will obey his word, you'll follow through, and you'll be prepared for the day that you're standing in front of that giant. We've got to wake up a little bit here. Their fear dissipates with the storm and gives way to a greater terror. You know what that is? (laughs) It's Jesus. It says in verse 41, and they feared exceedingly. Wait, hold up. Weren't you just scared of something else? Yeah, we were. We were pretty afraid that we were all going to drown in this boat. But then this guy stood up, and it, I love it how they put it. It says, he rebuked the wind and then said unto the sea, peace be still. How did he rebuke the wind? He just gave a little mean mugging. 
He went like this. And the wind stopped. And then he said, peace be still to the sea. That's, I'm pretty sure that's how it went. <laughs> he was just like, he didn't have to say the word. He does that. Everything calms down. They're going to live. And it says that they, were, they feared exceedingly regarding Jesus Christ. They said, what manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? They were more afraid of Jesus than they were the storm. That's the record that God put there. They were more afraid of Jesus than they were the storm in their very spirit. It keeps happening. You'll go to chapter 5, you'll read about people that are afraid of the demon-possessed man, and then Jesus heals them, and then they get afraid of Jesus. They're like, this guy's terrifying, he's a monster. Wait, who tamed the monster? Okay, we're scared of him now. That's not dumb. You're like, who's the boss of that guy? Okay, so please leave. You're terrifying. To be more afraid of God than to be afraid of the storm. This is where we want to get, dear Christian. This is where we have to get. This is where we have to live. This is where we have to stay. That I am more afraid of God than I am of the storm. That I fear God more than I fear the consequences or the circumstances that find me in a place of deciding whether or not I should obey. I want to fear God more than anything else. Now, are we just talking about reverence? No, I'm talking about fear. A healthy fear of God. The best way I can illustrate that, I'm still learning, is the same way I'm afraid of the police. I, I'm not afraid of the police. I don't think they're going to bust into my house, steal my stuff, or anything like that. But I'll tell you this right now. Every time I'm driving and I see a police car, what do I do? I slow down. I could be doing 30 and a 35, and I cover that break. I'm like, whoop. I'm like, oh, okay. Hi. I think I better speed up. <laughs> we can get going here. Every single time. I got the whole family trained. They say, Dad, cop. Why? Why? I always drive the speed limit. I don't know what the problem is. But it's a real fear. I go, oh, I don't have to think about it. It's not conjured up. I have a fear of the police. You know what? They have power. Yeah. I told all our kids, listen, when you get pulled over, be respectful. Be kind. Be nice. Like, first of all, these guys don't really want to be there. Right? I mean, it's not a good job nowadays. It's got to be a calling. Our young men that want to go into law enforcement, I say, all right, pray about it. Make sure God wants you to. This world's going upside down. Anyway, be kind. Be respectful. Why? They have power. They have a gun. The guns are powerful. They have laws. They have handcuffs. They have tasers. They have mace. They have a, a, a judicial system behind them. I fear them because they have power. We ought to fear God the same way. He has power. And I want to fear God more than I fear anything else. That will help us walk in obedience. These disciples had his word, and God said, you're making it to the other side. And he rebuked them when they were afraid because they should have believed what he said. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's the recognition of his supreme power and righteous will. Listen to Jeremiah chapter 117. Jeremiah is a guy who preached the word of God in a time and in a place that nobody wanted the word of God. So he preached in Longview, <laughs> 2022. Salem, Oregon, 2022. We're tired of you Christians. We want you to go away. We're sick and tired of, of your old school, narrow-minded, bigoted, prejudiced uh, views uh, and the fact that you would actually believe that this is literally the word of God it's madness yeah no we are here we are here Jeremiah preaches this kind of crowd listen to what Jesus or what God says to him he says thou therefore this is Jeremiah 117 thou therefore gird up thy loins he says put on your big boy pants Brandon Hardy version and arise and speak unto them all that I command thee. Be not dismayed at their faces, lest I confound thee before them. God says, Jeremiah, do what I told you to do. And don't be afraid of them. Otherwise, you're going to have a problem with me. You want to be more afraid of them or you want to be more afraid of me? Don't be afraid of their faces, their mean mugs, their head shakes, their sneers, their voices. No, you be afraid of me. You can have a problem with them or you can have a problem with me. Which one do you want, Jeremiah? Jeremiah said, I got no problem. I got no problem doing what you say, Lord. And he went on and fulfilled his ministry. Listen, this morning. There are things in this world that are scary. And you can be afraid of sickness. You can be afraid of disease, you can be afraid of natural disasters, I don't know. But that's not the stuff that really messes us up. The stuff that messes it up is when God says, listen, 
I want you to be bold in your workplace. And you saw that flyer that says that they're having a meeting uh, for all interested parties and in joining the tolerance committee at work. And I want you to go get on that. And you might last five minutes. Go get on it. It's a place of voice for voices to be heard, things to be spoken. Truth can be inserted. God says, I want you to do this. You got that coworker, you got a boss, you got a boss, you got an HR department that says, listen, you can't pass out tracks here anymore. If you keep doing this, we're going to fire you. You're like, well, I'm on my lunch break. It's my coworker. He asked me what I'm reading. I say it's the Bible. I say, here's some more information on it. It's my hour. We're outside on the back deck. I'm going to keep passing out tracks. If you do that, you'll be terminated, and we get scared. And we start going through things. And yet God has impressed upon your heart to be a bold witness. You're sitting in this place, and you need to figure out, are you going to trust him? Are you going to fear him? Or are you going to fear losing your job? Are you going to fear an employer, an HR department? Are you going to fear a neighbor or losing a relationship? I would, but I'll lose this relationship. Do you understand God's people have had the biggest and greatest and last, longest lasting impact on this world when things were just drop dead scary? When the government said, shut up or we'll kill you, and they were killing people? Times when the preachers would come in and they'd preach the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. And that wicked government would drag that preacher out on the front cobblestones and cut his throat. And his blood would be shed. And that church would show up the next week, walk over that dried blood, and another man would step in that pulpit and preach the gospel. That we have been built on a legacy and a heritage of men and women that have feared God more than anything else. When relationships and marriages, when you're in this darkest, scariest place, when everything's on the line and the Christian steps up and obeys God, lives are changed around them. That's when we have a great, great power. People go, that's nuts. He was willing to sacrifice everything for his God. Where do you go to church? When we shy away from the scary things, when our faith is little and not in his word, we lose an opportunity to bring him glory. No one would blame you for being afraid. Yeah, no, it's hard to witness. Yeah, no, it's awkward. Oh, I totally understand what you're saying. No, you don't want to trust that person again. Or you, you can't, you, you don't want to get back into that uh, sort of thing. Or listen, I know you made vows, but they've dropped their end. You know what I mean? And, and, and you're just, you're right to be afraid to just stay in that relationship. It's just, it's just too bad. People would say that's very natural to be afraid. But you're just not natural anymore, dear Christian. You're just not. You're supernatural. Partaker of the divine nature, Holy Spirit of God, mind of Christ. You're brand new. You can't be natural anymore. Every time you're natural, you're the old man. The supernatural is Jesus Christ. No one would blame you, but are you going to live by faith or not? Are you going to trust him or not? You know what's scary for young people? Waiting. Waiting. When you get old, 10 years is five minutes. It's crazy. Time flies. I, you say, you know, I want this, I want this so bad, but I might have to wait, you know, a year for it. <laughs> when you get old, we don't even know what year it is anymore. We're like, at 20-something, I don't know. It's... Like, boom, it flashes. I was told that, I believe that, and I can verify it. it. It does, it flies by. Young people waiting. Miss my spouse, miss my job, miss my calling. I just can't wait. I got to jump ahead. Abraham saying there's a promise on my life, but I haven't had it, so I'll just have Ishmael. And we've been fighting that forever. Thanks a lot, Abraham. Wish, wish you'd have waited. Waiting's scary, though, right? But are you going to live by faith or not? Do you believe that God's will is really intact? That he really will take care of you? That he, is, he will come through on what he's promised you? Waiting can be scary. These are the things that mess us up. It's, it's not the government. Like, oh, I'm not afraid of them anymore. We're having church. Like, no, no, no. It's, uh, I'm scared to witness. I'm scared to give. Ah, these missionaries are cool, and I like to say amen when we get a good praise report, but I don't give, so I kind of don't really amen. Yeah, yeah, you shouldn't. When you give, you can amen. That's part of your fruit. That's part of your praise. But you're scared to. We're not going to make the bills. Okay. Did God tell you to or not? Are you going to trust him or not? Are you going to live by faith or not? Are you going to strap on the helmet of salvation or not? The armor of God. Let's go. Jesus comes back tomorrow. You know how many things you wouldn't be afraid of? 
We'd go make everything right with everybody. We, we'd preach Christ to everybody. We'd say, I know I've worked with you for 22 years, but I got news at church today that my Savior is coming back tomorrow at noon, and I would hate to meet him tomorrow at noon and, and know that I did not tell you about Jesus Christ. So I know it's weird and it's Sunday, and I never call you on a Sunday, but you've got to know this. Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. And you'll either believe him and trust him or, listen, or you're going to perish, and they're going to think you're the weirdest person in the world, but you don't care because Jesus is showing up tomorrow at noon. You're not afraid anymore because you believe. I'm going to make a decision to live by faith or by the flesh this week. And when I live by the flesh, there's a lot of stuff to be scared of. And I could be rightly rebuked by the Lord Jesus who said, didn't I tell you? We're going on the other side, man. Believe me. Father, I pray that the Holy Spirit would bring to our attention those things that we are afraid of right now. Maybe, maybe the fear has dissipated because we came to church and we've sang the songs, we've been around God's people but it was there yesterday and it most likely will be waiting for us tomorrow and so I pray the Holy Spirit would bring that thing to the attention of your people right now. The thing we were scared of yesterday, we were worried about we were stressing about, we were anxious about that thing that arrested our spirit and brought us into a place of captivity I pray that would be brought to the mind of each person here that your spirit would do that and then we would address it biblically. Lord, I pray we'd repent, we'd confess it, and we would trust you and obey you and we'd fear you more than we're afraid of that. And that your, your people would then walk in a freedom and a power and a boldness that brings you glory and honor and the perfect will that you have for them in their life. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor House. Let's all stand together. Turn to hymn number 160. What are you afraid of? Where you invest your time, your money, that's going to tell you what you're afraid of. That's going to tell you what you fear. It's going to tell you what you really live for. Who you living for as we sing. every head bowed and every eye closed this is as private as personal as we can make it for you listen this morning Christian I want to talk to you first you notice that they got scared and they didn't follow the Word of God and the very thing that God used to get rid of the circumstance was the Word of God maybe you're the person that's here and you're going through the trial you're struggling through it and, you know, we always want to take control over those things and try and work it out ourselves. And it's kind of like this morning's message, you know, oh, well, now all we have left to do is pray. And we kind of do that with God, too, with his word, all those promises that we have. We forget that he came to give us life and to give it more abundantly. And we, we grab on, we're trying to manipulate all of our circumstances. And yet God has been there the whole time. His word's still the answer even when you and I have failed. Listen, if you're here and you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, Pastor Yant is up here in the front. We would love to show you from the scriptures how you can know for sure that you have a home in heaven. Listen, you're in the storm of life right now. You're taking on water, but the problem is you don't have the Savior in your home. And you need Him. He'll save you. Today is the day of salvation. If you're here, you don't know for sure that you have a home in heaven. 
let us show you from the scriptures how you can know for sure. It's not joining a church. It's not doing some good work. It's putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Let us show you from the same word of God that the disciples should have believed in in the first place. Let him take you to the other side. They made it, but they were always going to make it. Amen. Amen. Brother, that was a good message. That was a great challenge. Um, man, what a blessing. What a blessing that was. What are you afraid of? You know, there, I'm ashamed of how many things I've been afraid of that have kept me from doing what I knew to do, what was right. And um, man, I, I'm so thankful that just like the disciples, how many tests do you go through that you fail? You know, and um, I think that keeps us a lot because a lot of times we fail things, we're struggling, we get backslidden, and then we're kind of like the prodigal son where we're like, man, if I go there, maybe he'll let me be a servant. No, the thing, you're still a son of God. He's, he's looking afar off, waiting for you to come back. And, uh, and he's there. And I'm so thankful that the disciples could fail the test. And God still took them to the other side. He should have just flung them all off the boat. Because that's what we would do, right? But uh, no, he, he, he was there. He took care of them. It's never too late to come back to God when you fail over and over and over and over again. So, uh, man, keep going. Keep going, church. Let's do something great this year. What a blessing that was. Pastor Ant, would you close us in prayer? Uh, make sure that you get around. Uh, we have uh, Pastor Harding for the next service as well. So stick around for the afternoon service. Um, and, uh, man, but please get around. Thank him for being here today and taking time from his church and spending time with us. Pastor Ant. I really needed that.